Good evening and welcome to the first ever Cavan Players Pathways broadcast. Uh, it's an initiative put together by Cavan County Board and um, it's with players, current players, older players and uh, it's basically to focus on the characteristics of elite players and the values that they have developed through participation in the GAA and in their career and employment pathways. Uh, first of all, I speak to the Cavan County Board Chairman, whose initiative this is, and who will tell us just a little bit about what this entails. So I suppose, Kieran, we can't start such a broadcast without reflecting on 2020, the year that it was, and of course, the success that Cavan achieved. Oh, 2020 is on the of the year for numerous reasons, and I suppose we can't go just to start, you know, and I suppose sympathise with those that lost family members in 2020 and even currently in 2021. It's been a tough year. But for Cal and GA done last year, and I don't think I'll ever forget the Ulster final with only media and it. The surreal of the news coming through of Tipperary winning and could Cavan make the four teams that made the provincial winners? I don't know, it's just the hair standing on the back of your head above in Armagh, that's unknown. What they've done on the field in the four games um, was unbelievable. And I think compliments to every player for the commitment, determination, and self motivation during lockdowns when the training was on last year. They've just brought such joy, not just to Cavan people, but to the country for the way they played and the way they represented Cavan was just unbelievable. And so, tribute to every player on the panel, the banker and team, and everyone else. Kieran, what is the general aim of this particular project? I suppose, Owen, we're looking at this here, right, and, and the big challenges for players is the time commitment they're given at inter-county level. And we have to look and see how can we help the player off the field. So in, with coaching games in Cavan, we have a brilliant system, right? Um, the whole way up, where we have volunteer coaches, we have strength and conditioning, we have everything in place on the field to make the best player on the field. But it's so important to look at the player off the field and how can we help them develop? And I suppose the time management and working together, and obviously to have to think about the career as well, which is so important. So what I'm saying is, you know, we're trying to look at companies and partner with different businesses, look at career paths. And we're trying to educate from TY students up, you know, on what road they're going to ensure that there is employment locally in Cavan and that we can work with local companies to, and this goes across all goals. This is across the ladies football, uh, Camogie, Horrors, and, and the elite footballers, Cavan senior team, but all the development squads as well. And so we're opening this up to a mass of people, which will benefit the clubs of Cavan as well. And I think it's very, very important if we can get work local, stay local. And I think that's the initiative own about it. Now, who will be the overall beneficiaries of a project like this? I would hope the players and the clubs of Cavan, plus Cavan County, County teams. Plus employers, I presume. Well, absolutely. Because what do you get with, a, with a, a footballer? You get the same commitment off the field that you get on the field. And you get the same desire to win, desire to drive on. To, you know what I mean? Everything that a quality class footballer has given you, to give it the off the field as well. As an employer, you can't, that's what we want. And how do you envisage this actually working in real life? Well, what we work with is, is we're currently with another group of people set up who is working with businesses, okay? But we're creating different plans and different platforms. And then we're going to introduce, say, <clears throat> players to graduate programs within businesses and partner with businesses that they will identify or people say who is interested in whatever area they're in, and we identify the, the business that suits them in the locality and create employment. So if a fellow studying for just say for example, say a quantity surveyor, that we can get them, that he can study quantity surveying during the year, but in the summer he works with a company quantity surveying. And what we're trying to do is that they're educating themselves as well. So we're trying to open doors, and then it's obviously up to the players to keep the doors open. So that's, I suppose, the way it's going to work on. And it's going to be win-win. And I'm talking about win-win for employers, win-win for Calvin, win-win for the, the player. That's what we're looking at on. Now, 
if we look at 2020, 2020 has been a major successful year for Cavan. So success on the playing fields by footballers is obviously a major boost when trying to implement a scheme like this. Absolutely, Owen. But it just shows now, sure. You know, we have to move and evolve with the situation we're in. Like, it, by the looks of things, COVID is not going away very quickly. So we have to work on different solutions. Like, just for example, Calvin Digital Hub. How do we promote it? How do we promote other businesses? How do we promote Kingspan? How do we get Calvin players working in Kingspan? You know what I mean? And all these other companies, great businesses in Calvin, and create fellas work locally because the commitment, the gym sessions, everything else that has to be done for Cavan GA, it eats up time. And I think you'll talk to the lads, they'll explain some of the commitment that they're given now. When you look at what you're aiming at, what type of advice would you give, for example, to employers? You will not get a better worker than a player that plays GA at the top level or at any level. Because, and the same attributes, and you can nearly, the attributes of a player and the attributes of him working, you could nearly collate them on the field alone. It's unbelievable. And I could go through that with numerous players, and you look at some of them's technically very good, and they will be the same on the field. And some of them will be rough and tumble, and they will be on the field, and they will be a work. And it's just, that's, you know, it's, that's what you're getting on. You're getting honesty. And similarly, you would say the same to players who are envisaging a career path in that they implement their ethic, their work ethic on the field of play to their work ethic to an employer. I would think that goes without saying, Owen, because there's no, you know, there's no free lunches in the country, you know what I mean? So, you know, a player who is working or whatever, he, employers want their pound of flesh as well, and it's... That's the reality. So there's no hiding spaces in the workplace now. There's no hiding places anyway. You've just got to go and do your day's work. Kieran, thank you for the moment. Uh, I'm glad to say so that much. I'm glad I'm joined by four members of the successful cabin team from 2020. Team captain Raymond Galligan, Niall Murray, who's the vice captain, Kieran Brady, and Oshin Kiernan. Raymond, if I, if I could start with you. Um, was it a dream come true or was it something that you had complete belief in that you could achieve what many perceived as unachievable? Yeah, I suppose it was a bit of both. Um, you know, it was an absolute uh, honour and a dream come true when we, when we uh, got over the line against Donegal. Um, but I suppose uh, like that, um, back when, when COVID kind of Last March, it was very hard to know what way things were going to go. So, um, but to turn out the way it did for the year that we had, you know, it was uh, it really was phenomenal, to be honest. How difficult was it in the space of practically two weeks to turn this thing completely around? I mean, you went to Kildare and came away without a victory, and it was a game that you could have got something out of. Uh, you played an under strength Roscommon team in Kingsland, Breffney, and Again, you lost, and you were relegated really to Division Three. And other than getting to a provincial final or winning it, you the Talton Cup was staring you in the face. But as a group, in the space of a couple of weeks, you gathered, gathered your thoughts and your momentum, and you went into an Ulster Championship. And no one will ever forget your final three against Mana. Yeah, it was. Um... It was funny, we, um, going into the Monaghan game, we actually had a lot of belief that uh, we had done so many league games, you know. Um, against Kildare, we had um, scored, uh, put up a great score against Kildare. I think we kicked 20 points. And on the flip side, uh, we probably conceded too much. Um, and when we played Roscommon, it was kind of uh, the opposite, where we defensively were very tight and we probably just didn't score enough. So... We knew going into the Monaghan game, if we got the balance right, that we actually weren't off far away. And thankfully, that week going into the game, uh, we drew a line on it straight away on our first night back training. Um, and of course, it was backs to the wall stuff because we knew we needed to put on a performance. Um, and you know, every man stood up from from one to uh, one to twenty six that day. And uh, yeah, we got the result. And from then on, we just uh, 
we kept backing ourselves from uh, going into each game. Niall, you had to watch the most of those games from the sideline, given that you've had to go to London to, to get surgery. And what was it like watching from the sidelines? And in particular, you know, ha- had Cavan lost to Monaghan in that first round, there would be people looking for Gaint. Yeah, it was a funny one, now, to be honest. Uh, I suppose I, I had a bad year and I had injuries, so I got a surgery in March and then came back, played with the club, and then I was actually against Ray's team, Lack, and got another knock and was out again. And we thought the year, I thought the year was over, but I suppose it was actually Andre Quinn, who's part of the backroom team, and actually said to me, What if he goes, then you could be back if Cavan got to an Ulster final? And he goes, That uh, you might as well do everything in your power that if you do get there, that uh, I'm obviously not sitting there sitting on the sidelines, uh, wondering what if. So I suppose I give it that me all. I was lucky enough. I actually came back for the Kildare game, but I was well off the pace. Now, even the Ross Common game I started, but I didn't last too long. Now, to be honest, I was well off it. But um, I was just delighted to get back and off involved for the Monaghan game. Got maybe 20 minutes there. And then, um, obviously, probably got on a few more games after that. So, we, uh, to be honest, it was just an absolute dream come true. Um, actually for the group because we've gone through so much and when you're relegated it's easy to s- actually stop and point fingers and give out for blame and see what the reason was but I don't think any of that really happened as kind of uh, Raid said on the Tuesday night we in, I've got back as a group we all um, we all just decided right lads let's just give this one good crack and obviously it worked out for us Was it fair to say that you deliberately fast-tracked your rehabilitation on the basis that you had the knowledge that you had a belief in this team? <laughs> yeah, well, I can, I suppose like, it's been said to me in the past that I just had blind faith in this team. Like, I, I know there's a lot of friends of mine would have said, even from the Gales, might have said, why are you bothering coming back? Like, you've already, you, that you've already got these two surgeries. Like, you're only putting yourself more at actual risk. I just, I've been around panels. I've been actually, I think this is my 10th year on the um, Astral panel and there was just something different. I just thought something was bubbling. I just thought we were going in the right hand of direction. Obviously, the relegation, I didn't see that coming now. But, um, like, obviously, thanks for that. We were just right in the end. Kieran, is it fair to say that when you see somebody like Niall doing everything he can to be back part of a panel that's very strong and, uh, you know, hard to pick teams or whatever, that that gives an inspiration to players to see what your colleagues are doing? to be pushing for places again? Of course, like, you know, Niall's our vice captain and he's in that role for a reason. And I suppose, unfortunately, when you get an injury like Niall's, you actually, you actually have to do more work than your average player to, to get back on the field. You have to double up in sessions, maybe two sessions a day. And over the course of a week, you know, you're adding on three or more, four, three or more sessions than everyone else actually has to do the team. So, you know, the requirements to get back from injury like that, like he had, you know, are huge. And I suppose it's credit to him that he did get back and he did feature in, in, in the big games this year. Tell us a little maybe about the bond that there is between the players and, of course, the management who lead them. Yeah, well, I suppose the entire backroom team and our manager, Mickey Graham, you know, they've knitted a tight-knit squad and, and we could see something in beckoning. Even from lockdown uh, this year, you know, we're all given our individual programmes. We're all individually responsible. We came back and done some testing after lockdown, you know, and people were getting new PBs right across the board. And it was kind of testament to the coaching staff to give us these programs and for the players to deliver and, and, and put in the work and the hard yards way out away from, you know, Breffney Park itself. Um, I know myself, I found one straight patch of road out between Gowna and Arva. It's called the Bog Road, one straight road. And I had two months running up and down that, you know, and at that stage, it was quite difficult from time to time. You knew you weren't going to be back playing anytime soon. But thankfully, you know, everything collectively, when you knew 33 or more players were doing that, you know, you, you're, you're on to something when you go back down after lockdown. While you were on that road, were you ever tempted to throw your lot in with the corner? <laughs> well, funny enough, Dermot McCabe, our selector, lives in the road. Now, I wasn't trying to lick up to him by running on that road, so I wasn't in front of his house, but it just, it just happened to be that, the one straight one around, <laughs> within the 5K radius. I suppose when you talk about Oshin Cairn and 
the one thing that springs to mind, Oshim, is probably your point in the Ulster final. You might tell us about it again. It was phenomenal and it meant so much in the broader terms of success. Yeah, um, I suppose when you're playing the game, you're not thinking of, you're not thinking of Ulster final, you're not thinking, you're just kind of playing the game, you get into the zone. Um, and as, when you kick one point, you kind of get a bit of confidence from that. So I got the opportunity and I just, so we booted it, but if any other player was in the same situation to do that, uh, Niall popped the ball off, but um, there's been lots of big scores throughout the championship. Um, so I wouldn't just pick that one, but um, yeah, just uh, even even Niall popping the ball off shows the belief that um, we're back and every man backed each other to take on them scores. Is there a philosophy within the panel that if you don't shoot, you can't score? Um, yeah, a bit of that, but he, he, he has to be in the right positions too and, and work it. Um, but yeah, that, definitely, you have to go for it and you can't, you can't sit back and, and, and wait for things to happen. You have to go and make it happen. When you look at the overall season and, and how it panned out and you've got to play Dublin in, in Croke Park in an All-Ireland semi-final, at the beginning of the year, Roshan, was that, was that something that you said could happen or possibly will happen or most definitely will happen? Well, you, you suppose the start of the year, you come together and you set out goals, um, long-term goals and short-term goals. Um, as every team does, uh, so Ulster was was definitely one of those. Um, the year before, we made it to the final, and I suppose um, we learned a lot from that, and we believe we could do it. Um, so for it to actually for it to come off, it's it's brilliant. Okay, well we're we're going to condense this just a little bit now, uh, and we're going to bring you through, uh, particularly our viewers. We're going to bring you through uh, various aspects of how this can work. We're going through leadership, communication, challenges, resilience, and we'll be dealing specifically with the players with regards to that, which will hopefully be helpful to the target market that's out there who will be watching this. And of course, I'll be starting with Raymond um, as captain, as leader. Uh, you made your debut. You're one of these unusual players in that you've made two debuts. You made your debut against Donegal in 2012 as an outfield player. And then, I think it was Terry Highland decided against Monaghan in 2015 that uh, you would play in goal. And you've become better known as a goalkeeper than an outfield player, even though that you probably still play in goal for your club or outfield for your club, rather. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of, it's, um, it's been a funny journey, that's for sure, over the, the last number of years. Uh, I actually started off back in 2006 in Tommy Murphy. So um, I've had, uh, I've seen uh, many different roads, I suppose, being involved with Calvin. But uh, I suppose uh, looking back now, I couldn't, I wouldn't change, change any of it. And uh, absolutely so fortunate and honoured, I suppose, to be been, been captain to, to lift the cup there a couple of months ago. So yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a strange but very rewarding uh, path, that's for sure. Yeah, well, we're talking to you, uh, Raymond, particularly about leadership and I suppose the importance of leadership skills, both in sport and in employment. And you would concur that it's crucially important. You know, leadership is very important, regardless of what aspect of life or what avenue you pursue. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, I suppose... My own background, um, I manage a uh, day service for adults with disabilities uh, for St. Michael's House in Dublin. Um, and I suppose that, again, learning over the year from uh, being involved with different teams, be it in work or be it uh, with, with the club or county, that um, when you are leading and you're trying to manage, um, you need to, actions do speak louder than words in a lot of the situations. You need to be able to... Uh, you need to be able to create an environment where uh, the team will row in willingly with you, that it's not forced and it's not just because they're getting paid at the end of the week, that you need to make um, decisions, but you need to be, make it that uh, everybody is willing to, to jump on board and, and you know all have the same vision going forward. And I suppose it's a case, Raymond, of you not asking people to do something that you wouldn't do yourself. Absolutely, yeah, like that, as I say, 
Uh, it's very important to, to back up what you say. Um, it's the same with training, it's the same in, in work that um, you know, you have to be honest with yourself um, and you know, you have to be highly motivation, motivated uh, for the role, be it um, if, you, you know, if you're trying to lead a team in work that you, know, you have to show them that you know, you're passionate about it. And, and like the Isaac Cabin, um, I, I cannot be trying to expect lads to be pumped up for a game and uh, you know, being honest with themselves if I'm not being honest with myself and being honest with them. So I think it, it works both ways, but you have to lead by example uh, with, with, with all ways in, in, in working and, and Cabin. I think an example of that, and I was privy to it, whether I should have been or not, was when you had the team in a huddle after the Ulster final success, where you deliberately indicated to everybody, because of the COVID restrictions, there were panel members who were unable to be there uh, because of the rules that were in place at the time. But your first focus was to bring the Anglo cell back to Kingspan Breffney to share it with the players on the panel who couldn't make it on the day. And that was a real example of leadership, in my opinion. Yeah, I suppose that, like, um, we did, I, I spoke with a few of the players uh, before the training the Friday night and just made it very clear that, you know, the plan will be that we're, we're, we're coming back here. Um, but because it was such a collective um, performance um, throughout the championship that it was very unfortunate that, the guys from number 26 to, to, to 40 couldn't be involved. And um, we knew once we won that game that um, you know, there'd be no speeches or no uh, celebrations until we had the entire team. And uh, yeah, thankfully the plan worked out. Um, and, you know, but it also you know, showed everybody that there's no one person bigger than the team, that it was such a collective um, unit. And, and you know, thankfully we, we got doing that. In leadership, uh, Raymond, how important is the likes of time management to study work or sport? Yeah, I think it's probably one of the most important aspects of, uh, of leading. Um, you know, I personally feel, you know, timekeeping is just, it's, it's one of them pet hates for me. Um, you know, it's people being late, I just find it nearly unacceptable. Uh, I understand you can be stuck in traffic and it, it's, uh, it's very easy to be late, but if someone's constantly being late, it's a, it's a kind of a disrespect to be it the team or be it uh, work. But I think it's important to uh, manage your day. We're very fortunate with Calvin that we we have we know what we're doing for four weeks in advance. Obviously, things have changed now with, with COVID. But in normal circumstances, we'd have our, our month's roadhouse so that we know what nights we're training. And it goes back to just even organising your 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 food, organising your travel. So. Um, myself and Nile will be coming up and down from Dublin, so it's just knowing to uh, leave the house with your football gear and the minute you're finished work, get that, get on the road, get time to prepare for training, so that you're actually you're going into training, uh, likewise going into work, uh, tuned in, motivated. But I also think planning is actually and, and mental health is such a it's it's, it's so important now. It, it actually helps de-stress you um, once you're organised and and you have. Uh, you're on top of, you know, your day. Um, it leaves that, you know, your own mental uh, well-being is, is a lot more at ease when, when you're well-organised. So, yeah, it's absolutely crucial to be... Uh, and what, sort of, what sort of barriers? I mean, when you want to be a leader, um, when you want to bring people along with you, um, what sort of barriers can people expect, be it in sport or business? I mean, you have, people have the leadership skills, there are other people who don't, but in order for you to implement what you want, what sort of barriers do you face in a situation like that? Um, well, I suppose the one thing when you're actually uh, working with a team, or uh, be it, again, it's in sport or work, you have to be very mindful of your own strengths and weaknesses. Um, I suppose that was one thing I kind of worked a lot on during um, COVID, um, last say February, March, April, May, I was actually I done a lot of like reflecting on my own way of communicating, uh, improvement, listening, because like that, um, you know, I'm not there's no one perfect, but I suppose it's when you're dealing with conflict or situations, being in work, dealing with staff, 
um, you need to be able to know who is the strongest or who is um, you know comfortable in situations to have difficult conversations. Um, and I suppose like that, same as in football, that you know there might be a certain player maybe not uh, pulling his weight and just being able to know that person to be able to address the situation. But maybe if you're not the right person, that you you know what other player maybe could approach it in a different way, and um, that'd be one barrier. Uh, it's just knowing yourself and knowing your team. But also, I feel social media is definitely becoming a massive barrier. Um, like myself, over the years, I would have been very uh, conscious of going on the likes of the Hogan stands and the different online forums, you know, and of course you're looking out to see what people thought of your performance and unfortunately when you fall into that trap that uh, you have to be willing to take the, the good but also the bad because um, you're only a click away from, you know, getting that negative comment that sits with you a lot worse than it would than being given the pat on the back and unfortunately I, I've been I've seen both sides of the coin you know, I've been very fortunate I've got a lot of praise kicking a point against Monaghan, but the reality is, is if you went out the following week and you let in a, a, a poor goal or made a bad mistake, that you, uh, the backlash is serious. So I do try and pull myself away now from social media over the last number of months because I've learned, you know, I was, it really had a way with me when I was younger, you know, watching that stuff and, and seeing maybe people commenting maybe that you weren't good. And I just ask you for young people, I'd say stay away from them as much as possible because um, it really is. Uh, there's nothing can be gained out of it, to be honest. That'd be definitely one barrier. And then same in work. Um, you know, it's it's coming too too common now for people uh, getting online and, and seeing making views with each other. Well, I suppose sadly, Raymond, it's it's very common and it is a form of bullying. Absolutely. Um it definitely is. And and you know, unfortunately, um when 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 you're playing at a high level of sport, um you're probably not educated enough to know. Uh, when you're starting off, the actual backlash until you get some success. Um, because I suppose for, for a long time we were kind of uh, under the radar as maybe uh, in, in recent years. But um, when you're getting that little bit more of an audience seeing Calvin playing and that, and um, you just have to be able to accept that, you know, people will criticise and, and undermine maybe certain situations or certain players. But it's just being able to deal with that and, and, and actually having such great friends um, on the team that you can actually know you can go and chat to them and be reassured that they're going to say, look, you done right, you made the right decision, don't mind such and such if you read something because uh, I do feel you need to have that uh, that friendship amongst the team as well that uh, they can be honest and reassure you that uh, things are things are right and, uh, and you're sticking to the right principles. Finally, Raymond, be it employment or be it sport or be it your normal day-to-day living, how do you create leadership? Yeah, I suppose it's not something that just kind of can uh, happen overnight. Um, you know, you hear the people talk a lot about culture and tradition. And I suppose as much as that can be helpful, you know, when you're trying to create an environment, I think it's important that everybody should be um, willing to create their own story. Um, have and have a fondness of talking about the past and talking about the great tradition of winning uh, Ulster titles and you know that was a, an unbelievable period in Calvin GEA but I suppose now we're, we're trying to create our own story and we need to be looking forward and it's the same as in work that you know everybody wants to lead by uh, to, to, should be aiming to be their own leader be it in work or in your own personal life making your own decisions and I think when you're being honest with yourself and you keep looking forward um, and, and believe in your own abilities that you will create a leader, uh, become a good leader. And uh, I think, yeah, honesty is definitely one of the main main points of, of creating it. Because if you're not honest with yourself, you certainly can't expect others to be uh, to follow you. So um, to me, that would be the major starting point. That's for sure. Okay, Raymond, we will be back talking to you again, and uh, that's very informative. Uh, Vice captain of the cabin team. Um, Niall Murray um, missed, as we said, most of the season, sadly, through through injury or whatever. But maybe, Niall, you start off by telling us your pathway through GAA study and, and ultimate employment. I suppose um, when I first started off playing GAA, I, uh, I actually wasn't that into it, to be honest with you. I was mad into soccer. I was five or six, and like anyone else, I, wanted, I was 
just kind of actually following Man United and that's who I wanted to play for when I was older and that's kind of the way it was going to be. Um, but I went to primary school in Farnham School and I had Eugene Riley there who is Chester Riley's dad. He was big into the GA obviously and he was nearly following up every Monday morning if you weren't up at Gales training why you weren't there and you need to give uh, a reason why you weren't there. So uh, I kind of got in with that way. Uh, and then I suppose through some pats then Eugene's brother JJ would have been, I was lucky enough, he was overall on my teams kind of growing up and then with school as well, he um, was the coach for the first three years of the school team. So, and then obviously with the Gales, so like, it, it was kind of with me the whole way through. Um, so far in the month, St. Pat's, and then obviously with the Gales the whole way through. Then I, when I'd done my leaving cert, I didn't really know what I wanted to kind of do after that. So I took a broad enough course. I done um, actually business in in UCD um, and then after that I'd done my three years there and still I didn't really know what I was going to do but I decided to take an offer from PricewaterhouseCooper who are an accountancy firm and I'd done a master's of accounting then in UCD there too um, which they actually paid for and then I suppose I went in there to PwC um, probably only 20, I was probably 21, 22 when I kind of started off and I'm actually still with them so I went to audit first and um, wasn't exactly what I had expected uh, but I'd done my accountancy exams it was a three-year three-year contract with them uh, done my accountancy exams and then some of the lads I was living with uh, were doing consultancy that were in PwC so it's more open you're writing actually different projects now and stuff like that. So I joined, um, I tried to actually change just within PwC, so I made a change there after three years and I've been in consultancy the last four years. Um, but I'm very lucky now with PwC because they sponsored the Gaelic Players Association. As you can see, some lads here have actually been actually nominated now for kind of All-Stars in a couple of weeks' time. So they kind of sponsor them and I've been very lucky with everyone I've kind of worked with. There's loads of GA players there. We have Michael Quinlan from Tip. Um, we have Con O'Callaghan. We have Owen Merchant. We have loads of Dublin players there as well. So I was lucky that when I did actually, um, actually start, people knew I, I actually was playing GA. And they, as Ray said about obviously time management and everything, actually like that. Um, as long as I was upfront and actually honest with them, like it was. When I go on to an actual project, first thing I will actually say to them is here, I, I'm actually playing football now, Calvin. On a Tuesday and a Friday, I'm going to have to leave at half four. But I'm starting at half seven, eight every morning. So as long as they realise I'm putting in the hours, I might have to do a little bit over the weekend or maybe work later on the other days. Uh, but as long as I get that done, no one really cares. Like that, as, as long as the work's done at the end of the day. I suppose the main thing is just making sure that if I'm leaving early, it's not someone else that's actually taking the burden off me. It's just making sure that I'm uh, actually pulling my own weight, I suppose, or whatever team that I'm on. Um, Niall, through, through, through your pathways um, and to where you are today from your primary school, communication obviously has been a key or is a key to anybody considering sport or indeed employment, that you're a good communicator or that you have the ability to do so. Yeah, and I can. I suppose it's is just the same now in life. Like you have to be able to talk. You have to be able to listen. And I suppose that's a big thing. Is um, actually being able to listen when you like people talk about communication and talking and that. But I suppose a big part of it is you have to actually stand there and actually listen to. And that's no point going off talking something that is completely off the um, off the cuff or off actually topic. Um. So yeah, no. It uh, it uh, it. Um, she really is and I suppose as I was saying there even when I am in work the very first thing I would tell them is I'm playing with cab I'll have to leave early on a Tuesday I'll have to leave early on a Friday and people know that and that as once once you're honest and up actually front with them as I said that they uh, actually don't mind that's just that it's just it now is 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 communication skills or uh, being a good communicator is that born in people or is it something that you create over time? I think it's something you would probably learn over time. Uh, obviously some people might be better at it or might be more actually comfortable in actually speaking maybe 
in the, the massive group or whatever. But um, like I know when I was younger, I was made captain of the Gales teams and I was very lucky to play in loads of underage finals. But I used to be, I remember I was 12, 13, I was more nervous when I was making an actual speech afterwards than anything else. Uh, I was absolutely terrified. And I remember actually talking to the manager about it and he's just like, go up and get it. He says, you have to get out of your comfort zone. And at that stage, he says, if you're living in your actual comfort zone, you're not going to go anywhere. So you have to go out. And he forced me into it. I suppose even when I went off to college, there was just actual presentations. And at the beginning, I was nearly the person to say, I don't mind doing the work in the background. I don't really want to get up and talk. But again, you have to put yourself forward. You have to um, actually teach yourself to actually be comfortable that kind of in front of a group. Um, so I, I know it definitely wasn't something that came naturally out to me. It's something I had to keep actually practicing and actually trying to learn. I suppose it is kind of a shy streak in people where a lot of footballers or indeed workers uh, do their talking on the field or do their walking, uh, talking in their place of employment. But it's a little bit more than that. Yeah, and yeah, and I, I suppose everyone, like, it's just putting yourself out there too. Like, and when you are communicating, it's just making sure you're clear and concise. Um, I suppose it's just about having an, like, it's just, like, it's just actually kind of relax and taking a deep breath, being the non verbal signs, like, it's your communication, it's your posture, it's maybe a touch of feel, using your hands, all that kind of stuff. So it is like, and it's, and obviously they're not something that actually comes naturally in to everyone. So it is, and I think it is something that people can actually learn that along the way. I think if we look at it currently as well, that there is this slogan, it's good to talk. And particularly yeah. in lockdown and particularly in a situation where youngsters are encountering difficulties, that it's good to talk. And, you know, maybe the importance of communication should be given to students to be able to express themselves. In difficult times, it's something that's obviously very hard to do. But if you can come to grips with it, Niall, it's obviously so important for yourself and for others indeed. Yeah, well, I think a problem shared is uh, is uh, actually you're actually having that problem. A problem shared is a problem halved. And uh, I suppose um, even in the local areas now, you're seeing during lockdown, there was awful, awful tragedies and people taking their own lives and stuff. So it was really sad. And I suppose that's why as as a national group of Calvin footballers, we decided we'd do that. We'd all go to moustaches and then... Um, actually that fundraiser and we've done it for the friends of Cavan on friends of so it's the um, it's the cancer unit now in Cavan we've done it for Peter House and we've done it for So Sad Cavan I suppose it is just so important the fact we are up there in the line of sight and stuff if people see us kind of doing something that will actually help and it's just it's just even to know when you are struggling pick up the phone like I suppose like, it isn't even picking up the phone if you are the one that is in trouble. It's just picking up the phone to your friends, your family, just ask them, how's your day going? Because that there's a lot of people. I know I'm stuck in an apartment up in Dublin here and I'm working from the kind of apartment. I'm mad to just get out of the house to go do, do my runs or do something or go out for a walk with someone, meet them for maybe an actual coffee or something. Because you just get, like, I think it uh, really has been tough for all these people and kind of, especially the actual older generation too, because they are obviously so scared now of actual COVID too. So it's just even pick up the phone to your mom, your dad, to your parents, to your grandparents, um, older relatives, all that. Um, no, but it uh, really is. And so it's, it's, it's now more than ever, it's good to talk and, and just yeah. don't be afraid to lift the phone. Yeah, definitely. Kieran Brady, um, super year for yourself. Um, and I suppose um, was National School in Arva the platform on which you built your success in sport and business? Yeah, thanks Owen. I suppose it was a great foundation or, or starting block to, to where I am now. Um, to say you're a product of your, of your environment or surroundings and I suppose I was lucky um, in the community of Arva where I went to primary school and and my my home as well that um was brought up with a love for football and an emphasis in sports sorry rather uh, right throughout my upbringing and um you know 
if I think back to primary school, our school principal, Vincent Mulvey from Cavan, um, he put a huge emphasis on sport while we were in school. And um, I suppose it was the love developed for sport and every type of sport there. And, um, you know, I uniquely was the only person in my class starting off in primary school for five years until I think third class, one other person joined. So I was kind of always playing with boys and uh, older than me and I kind of had to, you know, grow up fast. And uh, I was uh, in, a, in a big, a small, a small fish in a big pond, as they say. So I had to, I had to grow up fast and I suppose that's where it all started, yeah. It was something that progressed through your club and it was nice to be in a position because in certain circumstances where there are many players attached to a club, you ultimately have to go somewhere else, but you were able to progress and develop through your own club. I was. Um, yeah, I suppose I had many practical experiences that brought me where I am today, you know, from, as I said, primary school and then on to secondary school, I was you know, again involved in sports teams there towards the, my latter years. I was involved in mentoring programs for first years coming in. Then in my college days, um, I undertook a BA um, undergraduate in St. Pat's and Drumcondra, and I suppose there I got involved in volunteering programs and initiatives. Um, again, as one particular one was participating in a, in a pilot program. Um, involving juveniles in, in, in clubs nearby the college from varying uh, social backgrounds. And um, I suppose there again, I, I developed a, a want to be, you know, in the career where I am now, which is a, a primary school teacher. And um, then obviously, uh, I do another, I was, I done the cool camps. I remember when I was younger as well in them years. So I kind of always worked with you know, kids and coaching and sport, and I thought it was a career that was well suited to where I am now. How rewarding was that for you? And did it give you a different insight to cultures and different aspects of sport and play? Well, I suppose it did. It gave me great satisfaction, you know, seeing and, and coaching and I suppose teaching, seeing people getting, you know, you know, a sense of fulfillment and enjoyment from it. Um, you know, and to talk about kids dreaming and all this uh, sort of things and following your dreams and that. And, and you know, when, through coaching and through teaching, you can see people coming proud of themselves when they do this and they earn these little pieces of success along the way. And I suppose that's what gives uh, me the satisfaction of um, doing both those things. When at primary school and going through your uh, second level studies in mine was teaching something that you always wanted to do I suppose it was um Owen yeah um definitely I admired the mentors I had coaches throughout the club and then teachers at both primary school and secondary school and then as as I progressed through them so I did always admire them and I suppose I thought it was a field that would be well suited to me yeah now after you finished in St. Pat's did you go independently or did you just continue on doing what you're doing? I undertook a postgrad then. It was the BA I completed in Pats and then I took a postgrad. So that was that was two years that involved your teaching placement and your teaching studies. Was that in Griffith College, was it? Hibernia College. Hibernia, yeah. Mm -hmm. And how, dif how difficult was that on the basis that it was up to your own devices? Because obviously you were doing diff other things at that time. Yeah, well, I suppose when you're, you're, you're involved in sports and that, it, it's a little bit different from, from being in college. You're doing a lot from home. It's nearly like the current situation. So it is, you're kind of on your own a lot through the laptop. So, you know, your schedule and planning has to be quite good to be successful in it and uh, not let things get on top of you. So I think the sport accommodated it. It was kind of an outlet while it was doing that in your uh, four or five times during the week. You know, it was your, it was your out, out, outlet from from the, the studying. And self-discipline, obviously, during that period was crucial. It, it was, yeah. yeah. You have to have your priorities, I suppose, right. And is it something that you would have discussed with other players that this is where I'm at at the moment, I'm going particularly well, and, and you would have got encouragement from other people? 
Yeah, well, no more than what Niall touched in there. I suppose it's good to talk and, and, and to share your journeys with other people. And, you know, you learn, you learn from your elders and people that might have went through. I know I had some people who went through that same process from the club and from the county and that same career path. And, you know, I would have linked in with them and, 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 and got encouragement from, from their stories. Now, you are um, teaching in, in Cavan Town, as we know. So what sort of impact has Cavan's success on, for example, the pupils that you teach, that they are being taught by a Cavan County footballer who is perceived to be a star and who has an Ulster medal? How do you cope with that? Or, or, or is it an issue at all in class? Wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's an issue now. They see me every day, so I wouldn't. I, I don't think they perceive me as a star anyway, Owen. But no, so it's great for for them, as you said there. Um, I'm a teacher in the middle of Cavan Town, so coming up to the Ulster final, you know, the bunting, the, the atmosphere was created around the school. I know p- people couldn't go to the games, unfortunately, but there was a great, you know, a carnival atmosphere created beforehand. The staff here in St. Philip's. National School in Cavan were great in that aspect that they had the bunting up and, and their signs. And um, I suppose the kids living in here around Cavan Town, the night at Ulster final, you know, they all had their, their stories of the, the cars queuing for two and three hours to get down to the parade, you know. And it was, you know, when you're that age, I suppose you, you do re- realise this is something that means a lot. And when you see that gathering of, you know, thousands coming in and, and, and roads lined with people and jeering out cars, windows, you know, it, it's something to don't forget. And at that age, you don't forget, I suppose. And, you know, that gave me a great bit of fulfillment to, 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 to know that, you know, it, it shapes them and it gives them maybe a, a dream in sport too. Now, you, you're teaching in our county town and obviously there are a lot of pupils from other countries. Uh, in your school and how have they bought into this whole uh, excitement of Cavan and this integration it has to be helpful for pupils from uh, other countries to realize the culture of what we have and what we have to offer yeah well there's 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 such values in in GEA you know your community identity and and everything we do through GEA I suppose it helps to you know enriched community that, that we're in so it does you know and, and the respect and everything but a funny story one of the teachers in the school came up to me one day she had a kid in second class from I'm going to say a European Eastern European country that told her she for Christmas wanted a cap he wanted a Calvin jersey for Christmas so you know these are the kind of little impacts it has I it has has on kids, you know, and they were able to, she was able to tell me that the, 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 the kids in her class were able to name Cavan's 1 to 15, you know, so, so it is, it was great to, to see that. You are a star and so are the boys and they don't know it. Well done, Kieran, well done. Yes, uh, finally, Oshin, uh, we're talking a bit about resilience and there's nobody knows more about it than you do and you were confronted with adversary uh, at a time that you didn't expect to be in. How important, important was resilience during your time of illness? Thanks, Owen. Yeah, I suppose it is important. Maybe like, you can um, explain to our people exactly what, 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 what happened. Or how yeah, well, in 20, 2018, I was diagnosed with uh, testicular cancer. Um, so I got the operation then. And scans and all that after it had spread up in, into my abdomen, so I had to get four rounds of chemo. Um, so yeah, I just got the four rounds of chemo, and for me, it was just what's the next step that we can get done and get back to playing football as soon as possible. Because the way I seen it was, when I'm back on the pitch, it means that I'm healthy again. Um, so that was my focus, and that was the goal. So. I mean, apart from the wonderful and brilliant medical attention that you would have got at that time, how important was other things to you? For example, the GAA at that time, because you are a double medal winner with Castle Rahan. Yeah, no, it was massive. And at the time I was playing with Castle Rahan and they were a massive help. Everyone just jumped in. And um, even apart from that, the Cavan lads and Castle Rahan lads, it's all over the country. Um, those rival club teams, players were ringing and ch- just having a chat and 
there's lads reaching out that had experienced it before uh, that I'd never even known of. Um, so the GA was was massive, and it's a massive community. It opened my eyes really to to the community, the GA community. Plus the fact that you had an unbelievable confidence and a resilience to know that in time you would be better. Yeah, well, that's it. Um, and I reached out to a lot of people too, but. For me, it was take it day by day. When I heard the news, obviously it's shock. You can you can go both ways. You can put the head down, work hard, and and get back to where you are and where you want to go, um, or or just let things happen and give up in a way, which that was never an option. Um, so it was it was take it day by day. I when I got heard word, I wanted to know straight away when is the operation. I wanted to get done straight away. And then step by step and day by day. Um, you, you hear the word cancer, which is, is an awful thing, and it's it's affected so many families. Um, but I kind of wasn't looking at that bigger picture. I was just looking at um, what was next. Now, there were people that would say you came back uh, to the playing fields too soon, but you had the medical advice and uh, the belief and the confidence that your timing was right. Yeah, definitely. And it's all medical advice. Like I never, I didn't do anything that I wasn't meant to do. I was um, at the county final with Castle Raham the, the year I was come back. I was told it wasn't coming on and I, I kind of wasn't taking no for an answer, but it was the end of the day I had to listen to him. I wasn't getting on. That was it. Um, but um, yeah, exactly. And But these doctors, you kind of, you, you gain trust in them and, and um, that's what I had. I had full trust trust in what was going to, what they told me about the process and what was going to happen. I want to be back. So I just worked towards that. Now, has the resilience that was required during your illness period, has that impacted on you through life in general, i.e. employment? Yes, definitely. Um, I suppose you, 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 like every, it's an everyday thing. Um, I, I remember actually in 2016, I done my ACL. Um, which is it's reconstruction of the knee. I had to get an operation then, and I think that helped me towards when I heard about the cancer. That helped me because I'd already um, it's it's a tough injury. I was out for about seven months, um, so going through that, um, getting back from that, I think helped me then towards when I heard about the cancer. So, um, yeah, no, it, it is. But everyone has resilience. It's just when sometimes when you're faced with these challenges, you have no option just to put the head down and go for it so um um yeah it's just um that's it is it fair to say ashin that males in particular find it very difficult to talk about medical matters and in some people um uh, issues go undiagnosed for a long time so obviously you're experienced enough to be in a position to say if there's something not right, we talked to Niall about your mental health, but physical health is also crucial so much as well. So, I mean, I, I presume you can't emphasize enough how important it is for males in particular, and of course females, if there's something not right, check it out. Definitely. I, I left about five weeks and that's, that was even way too long, really. I should have went from day one. Um, but it's, I, I remember looking up um, about it and online and that and I found that no real males spoke about it or, or documented or that and which would have been a massive help for the likes of me just to read what I was actually getting myself or what I was going to go through but um, it's, it is very important and it's like the mental health it's massive to talk about too like when I was sick people could see I was sick so like people are talking asking how you are but but mental, mental health side of things people don't look sick so it's, it's important too to to reach out to people, and as like Niall said earlier on, a, there is a perception out there. We all know that this could never happen to me. Yeah, I suppose, but when it does, it does, and you just have to get on with it. Um, my father had a history of it, so I just had a quick chat with him after, and he was very calm. So I think that um, I think I was calm then from that, just to chat with him and. Uh, as I said, I reached out to a few different people. If there was any small thing that was bothering me, it was I was straight on the phone. Uh, it was Ronan Flanagan and Andre Quinn, these lads, and, and they, they were a massive help. And again, you trust in these lads, and it gives you confidence then to, to push on. You're back to where you belong, Oshie. Congratulations. We're almost at a wrap-up at this stage, and uh, we'll do around the houses a uh, quick Q&A um, with, uh, with the lads. 
I suppose, Raymond, um, what should young people and perhaps employers take from this first episode of the GAA uh, pathway, player pathway? Yes, I suppose for young people, um, one piece of advice I think is um, definitely, uh, you know, keep trying to upskill, be it if you are in college to, you know, kind of progress, move up through the ladder. Um, you know, if you're trying to go for a degree, keep seeing if the next step of a master is an option. Uh, getting work experience is valuable. So uh, linking in, I think um, young people should really make use of the, the Calvin players that are that are on the on the current panel, you know. Never hesitate to lift the phone and give us a call if you're thinking about going to college to do a certain subject that you get that background from someone that has done it, uh, the, the course because my own experience, like I started doing civil engineering for a few months and I re quickly realized it wasn't for me and I ended up going and doing a, a, a degree course in, in social care. And uh, So it's just a matter of, you know, getting the research, but using, using the guys that have done it already. And I suppose in regards to the employer, as Kieran alluded to already, you know, um, playing, playing sport really does mold you uh, in, uh, into... Uh, creating or learning about the valuable principles of, of a job, uh, you know, um, being punctual, being honest, uh, being disciplined uh, as, and working as part of a team. So, um, yeah, I think we, we, when you're playing at that level, it really can help you when you work um, in, a, in a job as well. Niall, what sort of advice would you give to young players uh, who are embarking on life and sport? I suppose it's just to ask as many questions as you can, Owen. Like, as uh, Ray's already said, there's a, a group of probably 41 of us on the Cabin senior team are happy if they want to ask us any questions. Lads are going to college and, like, um, we've lads from all different actual backgrounds, Ray's in the medical side, like, um, obviously Kieran is a teacher, I am in business, like, we've people across the board. So if people do want to do just to ask as many questions as you can. I suppose the other thing is, it happens for different. It happens at different times now for different people. Like there could be someone could go in as Ray says, you might go off to college and it might not be for you. You might drop out. You might be thinking, oh, this isn't for me. College is for me. But that there might just be another course that you go on and build towards, or it could be as I said, ask as many questions like and see what areas are out there and reach out like Secure and or any of us, and uh, we can try and help you. And of course, Niall, your, your, your final word would be, if you need to talk, please do so. Yeah, definitely. We go to Kieran. Um, having gone through your school, college and training and now into work, I suppose every youngster in many ways can realistically follow their dream. Of course, absolutely. I'd say to every young person is that if you follow your dreams, I suppose your confidence will rise as you as you get further into that dream and you'll enjoy the excitement and I suppose the adrenaline that comes with doing something that you actually you want to do. And on that note, one thing I would say and I is would be to never stop something or never stop believing. Don't quit. Keep going. Always keep going. I often think where some famous sports stars might be now or where any of one of us might be. If you think, look at, take anyone, for example, Cristiano Ronaldo, if he had to opt out maybe when he was in secondary school or somewhere and just say no to one team, would he be where he is now? So one thing I would say is to, to, to never quit. And finally to Oshin, um does success on the playing fields really open up opportunities for employment for players? I'm sure it does. I'm probably not the perfect man to ask that. I, I work on a pig farm and all is have. So um, it has definitely helped me through different um, barriers that I've come across. Um, but just to follow on quickly on, on Giron's point and never giving up, it, I think that's uh, massive. There's, and there's no pathway um, that's the same. Everyone's different. Uh, I didn't start playing inter-county football. And I didn't make any underage teams until I was 25. So um, if you just work hard, you can achieve whatever you want to achieve. Well, that's been intriguing. We're rejoined again by Cabin County Board Chairman, uh, Kieran Callan, And I'm sure you agree with me, Kieran. 
what we've heard from the boys over the past hour intriguing. This owner has just been invaluable. Like, you know, listen to them even for myself and just learning from the players. They've like, just been unbelievable. And I just want to wish all the young people in Cavan that's listening to this here today, take the positives out of everything or every roadblock that's put in your way and go around it, go over it or go through it and drive on. And that's, I want to thank you, Owen, for a brilliant host. The players for engaging and say, lads, look forward to another one as well. And thanks very much to everyone. Thanks to Kieran Callahan, Raymond Galligan, thank you very much, Niall Murray. Uh, Oshin Kiernan and Kieran Brady. We'd also like to thank Catherine Fox, who was our facilitator for this broadcast. And the good news is, we're back for more at the same time next week. Until then, bye-bye.